Yeah. I am here with Sarah Miller, and uh, you're a phlebotomist? I am a phlebotomist, also known as a donor specialist three here at Lifestream in San Bernardino. So what did we kind of do uh, to start this? We kind of got into it rather quickly. What was the procedure? So we just do isometric exercises. I collect about a pint of blood, uh, equivalent to a water bottle amount. We take a sample of vials to test the blood, and every donation you do is obviously testing to make sure it's safe to give to um, the patients. Yes, that's me, Ken Allen, managing editor of the Public Record, giving blood at one of the many Lifestream donation centers. It was my first time donating, so you won't want to miss the outcome of my experience. I'll also talk with Lifestream CEO, Dr. Rick Axelrod, who explains how the pandemic has made the need for blood donations even more urgent. And we'll discuss how business leaders like you can get involved. Coming up now on the Public Record Podcast. So they have me in a very comfy chair. I'm going to take it home with me and watch the TV on the ceiling. How are we doing over here? We're doing great. Good, okay. And uh, what will happen after we're done here? So you'll spend about 15 minutes in our canteen area where you'll get some juice, um, some snacks, just to kind of monitor you, make sure that you feel okay for the next 15 minutes. State law asks that we monitor you for 15 minutes to make sure you're feeling 100% before you go. Maybe some lightheadedness or dizziness. Right. And what's the little thing that keeps chiming in the back? Does that tell you to go to the next step or something? So that's actually telling me your blood flow. So our scales here monitor how fast the blood is flowing. We only have about 20 minutes to collect the blood, and it chimes every every so often when it drops below 35 or 36 mLs per minute. We need to stay above that in order to get a good flow. And she's going to now uh, check me here and see how we're doing. I'm supposed to squeeze on this little heart every so often, lightly though, right? Correct. Just lightly, and I'm supposed to kind of move my feet. And what does that do? Those are our isometric exercises, just to make sure that you guys um, are keeping your body moving so your blood pressure doesn't drop. Because, of course, when you're donating blood, you're losing. So uh, instead of having you to faint or feel low blood pressure, pedaling the feet um, helps. Mm, okay. And how long does this usually take? Anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes. Well, it's probably not a good idea to lose too much at once, right? Yeah, you never want to bleed too fast anyways. I always like to tell my donors about 5 to 10 minutes is a good time. Not too fast and not too long either. And when you bleed normally, you know, if you cut your finger, uh, it coagulates pretty quickly. Is that a problem for the blood or does it go into some solution that prevents that? That's a good question that you ask. Um, yes, we definitely have some anticoagulant in our bags, and that is on a rocker that is constantly keeping it at a moving state so that the blood doesn't clot in the bag. Mm -hmm. And so what is it going into? I'm afraid to look. Is it sort of like a uh, the bag they use for transfusions and uh, let's say the stuff they use, saline solution? So it's just um, a bag. There's three bags attached to it with one long cord. So one is with, connected to the needle, and then it branches off down into the main line, and that's where we collect all the blood, and the anticoagulant is inside the bag already. And what's in the little uh, cafeteria? Just juice? We have juice, coffee, and chips, and cookies. A lot of people do it, do their donation for the cookie. <laughs> okay. We get that often. Get a little sugar rush. Mm -hmm. Are, do people react to this? I feel fine. I, I thought I might feel a little lightheaded, but I, so far I feel fine. Does it happen later? Um, it can happen later. It can happen during the donation. It all goes depending on the person. I feel like um, the heat can affect it if you're going to have it. Sometimes the mental idea, if you're a little nervous, then you can psych yourself out and kind of cause that reaction. But other than that, I, it just depends on the person. There's no guaranteed when it'll happen. Now, do I sit in this chair for a little while after? So I always suggest my um, donors take their time before they um, move to the canteen because you are going to walk away from me for a little bit. But if you're feeling great, I ask you sit up, let your body, you know, think about itself, and then, okay, I feel great, and then you proceed to our canteen area. Well, my alarm is going off here, so she's going to have to do something, I think, here. Anything you want to say in conclusion to get people to donate? 
Um, my name is Sarah and I love to see um, donors coming in every single day. Um, it's an opportunity to meet new people and the blood is definitely needed. We cannot make up blood. It's not something that we can manufacture. So we definitely need you guys to come on in. Now my guest today is Dr. Rick Axelrod from Livestream, uh, our local blood bank. Nice to have you. Uh, thanks for having me. Tell us what hospitals use blood for. So the majority of the hospital use is for patients that undergo surgery, mm -hmm. uh, particularly heart surgery is a big user. Uh, the other big user would be people that are diagnosed with cancer who have chemotherapy and uh -huh. radiation. And when you have that type of treatment, it affects your bone marrow and prevents your bone marrow from producing red cells and platelets. So you need transfusions as a result of um, uh, being treated. Uh, also, newborns is a big is a big one. Uh, babies that are born premature, mm -hmm. they tend to need blood transfusions because their bodies are not fully developed. Their circulation isn't good. They need to get oxygen. Really? Huh. The red cells carry oxygen, and, mm -hmm. and what's really critical in a newborn is making sure that all the tissues get oxygen mm -hmm. so that they can develop and and uh, and grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, newborns also uh, use a lot of blood, and then unfortunately. Uh, uh, gunshots uh, uh, is a big thing that happens in, oh, in bigger yeah. cities uh, and uh, those type of trauma cases or car accidents, mm. uh, those type of trauma cases are the other big users of blood. We hear about different blood types in the movies. Um, can you tell us what those are and are some in more demand than others or more useful than others? Yeah, so there are four different blood types. Mm. Uh, that's group O, group A, group B, and group AB. And what everybody hears about is Group O, which is the universal donor, which means that if we get blood from a Group O donor and we send it to a hospital, they can actually transfuse it to anybody in the hospital. So they those are the people in most demand. Those are the people in most yeah. demand. But what I'd like people to be aware of, they're most in demand for the red cell part of blood. Mm -hmm. But the plasma and platelet part of the blood, the group A and the group ABs are the ones that we really want to donate platelets and or plasma apheresis donation. That's an automated way of donating blood where we take just the part that we need, the platelet or the plasma, and we give you the red cells back. And it's all automated. It's all sterile. It's all one use only per donor. There's no risk of getting any sort of infection from doing uh, that procedure. But the group, a, the group ABs are the universal blood donors for platelets and plasma. You can give an AB platelet or an AB plasma to any patient, regardless of blood type. And the group A's are compatible with 90% of the population. So whereas on the red cell side, the group A's are only compatible with about 40 to 45% of the population. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is educate our donors based on their blood type, what product we would like them to donate. How can you find out what your blood type is? Well, donate blood, and yeah, then we'll then tell and you. then okay. we'll sell. You won't know on the day you're donating, right. but you'll know within 72 hours because we uh, we ask our donors to to start an account with us. Uh, so we have a donor account, and we post the test results and the uh, to the account, so you would know your blood type within 72 hours. So your message is everybody is equally important in donating. That's correct. It doesn't matter what your blood type is. We will find a place for you where we need your your blood. Now, there's another component to blood typing. It was RH, negative yes. and positive. Explain that to us. Sure. So uh, RH is an antigen, a marker that's on the red cells. There are many different markers. They all have different names, uh, like Duffy and, and JKA, but RH is one of them, and that's, that's the most dominant one. Mm -hmm. And 85% uh, of the population has the RH marker on the red cells. 15% do not. So if you have the marker, you're RH positive. If you don't have the marker, you're RH negative. So for the 15% that are RH negative, you only want to give them RH negative blood if they need a transfusion, which is why if you're RH negative, O negative, A negative, B negative, or AB negative, you're also really important to us because that's such a small subset of the population. We need to make sure you have, we have that blood on the shelf because if there's a B negative uh, patient in the hospital that needs blood, they can only get B negative uh, blood. 
Oh, wow. It gets complicated, doesn't it? It's very complicated. Do you often find that supply of one type is in the wrong place while it's needed elsewhere and vice versa? Absolutely. Oh, that boy. happens all the time. Yeah. And we're actually, our drivers are out moving product from I, one place to another. We have B-negative uh, blood at Eisenhower, but we have the B-negative patient at Desert Regional, so we got to move it over or vice versa. So uh, that's, uh, that's the challenge we have. Are blood donations used for some other purposes as well? Uh, not really. No. Uh, you know, the, uh, the occasionally. Because I uh, hear them hear it talk about harvesting platelets and such. Is how is that used? Well, that's di- that's so that's different. So, so uh, when when we when you donate whole blood. We just we make the red cell and the plasma component okay. out of it, but for platelets we do that automated. Mm. So because what happens is in the old days you you can you can create a platelet from a whole blood donation, but you have to create six platelets in order to have one therapeutic dose that's effective for a patient. When a patient needs platelet transfusion, they need the equivalent of six units. When we collect the platelets by automation, we get six units automatically. Mm. So that's the better way for us to collect platelets. So we're no longer making platelets from whole blood donations. We only do it from automation. Is it safe to say there's always a need for blood donations? Because we hardly a week goes by, we don't see an urgent request for blood this week. But is it, it seems to be going on all the time. There, there's never enough and, and partly, I assume, because there's a short shelf life for it. Tell us a little bit about yeah. how long it lasts. Yeah, so there is an, there is an urgent need for blood every day. The yeah. biggest challenge for us is educating the community that it's sort of like your car. You need to fill up gas regularly in your car for you to go get places. We need regular blood donations to the blood bank to make sure that the hospitals can do their job. We're the fuel. The blood is the fuel for the hospitals to be able to do their job. And when people think of other things to do, uh, like uh, like uh, they'd rather go to the park or they'd rather play tennis or golf rather than come in and donate blood, that has an effect on on our ability to supply the patients in the, in the hospital. And the other thing we're noticing is that the younger population is not as altruistic and community giving really? as the older population uh, when it comes to donating blood. That's the, okay. oh, maybe there are other okay. things that they they choose. But blood donation was a really big impetus that started after World War II. Mm. And people, you know, uh, through baby boomers have continually given blood. More with, you know, Generation X, Y, and Z, it is more challenging uh, to get them to come to the donor centers to come and donate blood. If we go to their school, the high school, they'll donate. Mm -hmm. But if we ask them to come to us, it's a little bit more of a challenge. And because of COVID... And schools being out of, oh, of, yeah. of, of uh, service, yeah. we haven't been doing any blood oh, drives dear. in high schools, and we lost a significant uh, donor population there. I wonder if it's because earlier generations were more engaged in the military, and they got used to donating blood as just kind of a routine. Um, interesting, interesting. Um, you, maybe the younger generation are more afraid of needles. How, how do you overcome your aversion to being stuck with a needle? Well, we what we try to do is educate the individuals that you may be afraid of a needle, and that needle only if if it hurts, it hurts for like a fraction of a second. Mm-hmm. Once the needle goes in, you don't feel the needle anymore. I ask them to put themselves in the patient's position. Think about the patient undergoing chemotherapy and radiation and all the side effects associated with that. Think of the patient undergoing cardiac surgery that might have their chest opened up and have you know weeks of recovery before they can get back uh, or even months of, of recovery before they can get back to normal that them enduring that little pain of a needle stick is a small price to pay for really helping their fellow man or woman that's in the hospital that really needs that blood product and if they think of the outcome of where that blood is going hopefully that'll make them overcome their fear of needles You mentioned having your blood drives at high schools, and that was something I hadn't thought of. That's very interesting. Uh, Well, we might as well talk now about who can donate blood. What's the age and other parameters that uh, qualify you? Sure. So first and foremost, let me educate everyone that there is no upper limit for blood donation. We often have times that people self-defer themselves because they think they're too old. They Mm -hmm. think there's an upper limit of 70 or 75. We actually have many blood donors in their 80s that are donating with us as long as you're healthy and well. You are absolutely able to donate. Well, 80 is the new 40, right? 80 is the new 40. So <laughs> no upper limit on, on age donation. As far as uh, younger, uh, 15 and older 15. can donate blood. 
But so ninth grade and up mostly. Uh, or 10th grade, I'd say probably. Okay. It's more 15-year-old. Uh, but if you're 15 or 16, you need parental consent. Once you're 17, no parental consent is needed. So anything hmm. between 17 and above, you can come and donate on your own. But if you're 15 or 16, you have to have parental consent, a signed form. And we have those forms that we supply. Okay. Uh, how do they get it, though, if the blood mobile is going to be there tomorrow and they'll need the form when they come? Well, so when when we do blood drives with the high schools, the high schools work with us and they, they send hand out. Send in advance. I yeah, they it. send in advance. Got but it. for people in general, let's say a 15 or 16-year-old wants to come, not be a blood drive at a high school, but wants to come into one of our donor centers and donate, they can actually uh, access that form on our website, ah, lstream.org, of course. and be able to pull that down and get it signed by their parent sure. and come into the donor and center and donate. And any 15-year-old knows how to do that for sure. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, probably on their smartphone. Um, do you see any more any difference between boys and girls donating at that age? Uh, actually, the girls are more apt to donate blood than the guys are. Are you yeah. kidding me? We find that the guy, the younger guys, are scared of needles <laughs> more than the girls. And the girl, and we, and we kind of joke. In fact, our staff, when they go out to high school blood drives. They always, the girls are calling the guys scaredy cats. And, and even the guys that are on the sports teams, you know, like the football players. And say, oh, no, no, I don't want to get a needle. Uh, so what's the current status of the blood supply in the Coachella Valley? So right now we are in probably the worst blood shortage we've had in years. Really? Yeah. And part of the reason is COVID. What's happened with COVID is that now that thing that the COVID crisis has been overcome and people are getting out and about, uh, blood donation is not the number one thing on the to-do list. They haven't been mm. out at restaurants. They haven't been out at the park. They haven't been out doing things that they normally do. They're taking vacations. They're not thinking about the blood supply. So low donations, high usage. We now have less than a half day of blood supply of every single wow. blood type uh, that exists. So we need everybody to come in. I don't care what your blood type is. We need you to come in and donate. Does COVID complicate the blood donations in that you have to test for that in the blood? Yeah, no, no complication. Okay. Even though even though we're uh, testing COVID antibody testing, uh, no complication. The other thing people should be aware of is vaccination. No problem. You can come in and donate if you've had your COVID vaccination. You can even come in on the day that you're vaccinated as long as you're not having any symptoms. So uh, people, some people think that because I'm vaccinated, I might not be able to donate blood. No problem at all. You can come in and donate. Are there other conditions that preclude you from donating blood? I don't know, sickle cell anemia or something of that nature? Well, yes, there, there are very specific uh, diseases that keep you from donating blood, but we ask people to come in and let us defer you because what we find is people self-defer for reasons that they shouldn't. For example, uh, if you have a history of cancer, as long as it's treated, and you're and you're cured you absolutely can come in and donate if you're if you have diabetes if your diabetes is well controlled no issue at all you can come in and donate if you have a history of high blood pressure but you're on blood pressure medications that keep you in the normal range you can come in and donate really so yeah. so we want people to come in and and what we say to them even though very and very few of them get deferred but even if you get deferred at least you get a free mini physical we do blood pressure we check your pulse we do your temperature we check Check your iron level, and you get that all for free, you know, and, and so at least you get like a mini health exam, even if you're going to get deferred. And if you are a same-sex uh, person, uh, can you donate? That is one of the deferrals that's still going on. Okay. So so just to let you know, we've made a lot of progress on that issue. Uh, the blood banks are supportive of having uh, members of the gay population donate blood mm -hmm. and to take away those deferrals. Uh, years ago, it used to be a lifetime deferral. Then it went to one-year deferral, and now we're at three-month deferral. So one of the things that's been interesting during the COVID pandemic is because people were no longer, and many people were not, single people were not having sexual contact during the COVID pandemic, we actually saw an increase in blood donation from the gay community because mm. they were now able to donate because they had not had sexual contact with a same-sex partner in three months. So that was kind of a, a one of the positive things that came out of the pandemic. But for listeners, if you still haven't, you know, had sexual contact in the last three months with the same sex partner, male to male, you actually can come in and donate. Good to know. OK. And, and we're working on getting that three months to zero. But that's going to be a little while. The Coachella Valley is a seasonal economy. Uh, and aside from this complication with COVID, but, you know, historically speaking, 
have the donations gone down in the summer or up? Well, what's the history there? Yeah, the donations do go down in the summer, mm-hmm. and that's a real challenge because, you know, even though the, the the people leave, you know, disease doesn't take a vacation. So cancer doesn't take a vacation. Car accidents don't take a vacation. Heart attacks don't take a vacation. They still need blood but we have less donors. So we try to educate the community. We have what's called the nine city challenge that begins July 1st and goes over the whole summer, the two months of the summer as a way of educating people. It's a friendly competition between the cities who can donate the most blood from the cities over a two month period. And we use that as our education to try to get people to come out and donate and don't forget about us during the summertime. Cause that's when we really need our blood donors in the Valley. My guest, Dr. Rick Axelrod, CEO of Lifestream, and thanks to phlebotomist Sarah Miller for giving us an audio insight into my donation of blood. And as you can hear, I suffered no ill effects from the donation. I enjoyed a cookie and orange juice in the canteen and then had an uneventful drive home. But in full disclosure, After filling out my paperwork, I did have to wait in the lobby for about a half an hour to cool off to bring my pulse in range to donate because the day I gave the donation, it was very, very hot and humid outside. If you live in the Riverside or San Bernardino County area and would like to donate, call 800-879-4484. That's 800-879-4484. The website is lstream.org. The letter L, stream, with no dashes or anything, lstream.org. They also have an app that you can download to your smartphone or tablet. The Public Record Podcast is a public service of the Public Record, the Coachella Valley's Business News Weekly. I'm Managing Editor Ken Allen. Thanks for listening, and please share our podcast with your friends. And please subscribe on your favorite podcast hosting service.